Hello, hello everyone. Uh, good morning. Welcome to the webinar Technological Solutions Throughout the Wind Energy Value Chain for Cost Redu Reduction, Sustainability and Energy Security. My name is Sigoni Ugalde. I am a market manager for wind energy sector in Technalia. And um, uh, the, uh, we would like to, to, to we would like to thank you for attending this event that Technalia has organized as a start point in the portfolio diffusion activities uh, scheduled within the Win, Win Europe Fair to be held soon in Bilbao. Um, uh, before starting properly with the introduction of the webinar, um, please let me remark some practical issues. Uh, first of all, uh, as, you, as you, you, you know, we will make four presentations uh, lasting 10, around 10 to 12 minutes each. And uh, another important thing is that you can introduce your questions at any time of the, of the webinar, but only using the question section of the app but uh, don't use, please, the audio is not permitted in this webinar, so only you, you can use this, the question section in the app. Uh, we have left 10 minutes uh, at the end of the event uh, in order to respond your questions. Um, another important thing is that we will upload the webinar video channel to the YouTube channel of Technalia and you will receive uh, a link to see it. Uh, we will also send you the presentations by email. So uh, and this, these things are important. And finally, um, please, we will also <clears throat> grateful if you answer a mini questionnaire um, that we will launch at the end of the event and it's a small questionnaire with a couple of questions about the interest of, the, of the, the topics and technologies we are going to present today um, uh, here. Well, we, what is the main objective of this uh, event or webinar for Technalia? The main objective is calling your attention uh, about some technologies that uh, 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 and certain lines that uh, we are carrying out, carrying out for the wind energy sector. As you will see soon, uh, uh, these technologies are focused on very different uh, technological lines, although they have uh, some common points uh, that are uh, the reduction of, co of cost, increasing productivity, increasing uh, sustainability and liability. Um, um, finally, um, I would like to remark as well that uh, for us it's important um, um, that you um, provoke that you um, provoke uh, um, um, interest on your on, on interest um, and um, provoke that you want to learn more deeply about these technologies, um, and if, if uh, that's happened, please, um, you are invited to visit our uh, stand, uh, that is the first DO22 in the Win, Win Europe Fair in, in Bilbao. So, um, uh, um, now let's move on, let's start with, the, with our first speaker. Uh, his name is uh, Germán Pérez. Germán Pérez received uh, the degree in telecommunication in engineering from the uh, University of the Basque Country, Spain. And Germán, since uh, 2008, he has been working in the area of marine energies. Uh, he's currently a, a head of wind energies uh, um, uh, of the energy climate uh, and Urban Transition Unit of Technalia, and he and his group has a long trajectory in the design and development of uh, uh, offshore floating platforms, components and systems around them, 
And uh, today he's going to explain us in a very general perspective some of the more relevant competences and add value of this work. Um, the title of his presentation is Our Contribution to Floating Wind Technology Development. And uh, Herman, it's your turn. Thank you, Irone, for uh, your introduction. Let me uh, check and share my presentation. Okay, can you see my presentation now? Can you confirm, please? Yes, I can see it. Yeah, but yeah. yeah. Okay, let's move on then. Uh, Thank you again, Igone, for uh, your uh, kind presentation. I'm going to explain very briefly, as uh, uh, we only have uh, uh, 10 minutes, uh, the activities of uh, Technalia in the, I don't know, if I'm, no. the activities uh, of Technalia in uh, uh, the area of uh, floating wind. Uh, first, we, I will start with a, a very short context uh, on the floating wind sector. And then I will move to our activities in these uh, 10, more than 10 years, 12 years actually, uh, in the uh, floating wind development with some figures, what uh, we do, uh, some achievements in, in the form of uh, some uh, projects we've been uh, working in, and uh, finally uh, the, our networking activities. Well, uh, as you may know, uh, floating wind uh, is uh, now Oh, we only have uh, 113 megawatt of floating wind installing installed in, in Europe. Some uh, some more in in Japan, but only some uh, individual prototypes. And this installation in Europe in Europe comprises some uh, small uh, prototypes from two to uh, four megawatt individual devices, and three uh, small wind farms, demonstration wind farms, uh, which are in Float Atlantic. Uh, King Cardin, also with wind flow uh, technology, and High Wind Scotland uh, in the UK. But in the uh, last uh, weeks, and uh, we've seen that the first uh, tenders have been uh, approved, uh, and the first of them, the Scott Wind, is very relevant because uh, 15 gigawatts out of 25 awarded gigawatts are for floating technology. That means uh, Highway water depths for for bottom feet. So uh, it's clear that the uh, market is moving to commercial scale uh, wind farms. Uh, we are talking about hundreds of uh, megawatts. We also have uh, the tender of uh, South Brittany in, in France in France for 250 to 170 uh, megawatts. France also announced that uh, they are going to launch. Uh, two other tenders in the Mediterranean with the same size for the uh, for the wind farms. Portugal announced last week uh, the intentions to uh, publish a couple of tenders for some tenders for three to five uh, gigawatts. Spain is also moving. Norway is also moving. So it's clear that uh, we te floating wind technology is moving from demonstration to commercial uh, deployment. We uh, at Technalia, uh, we have a small group uh, in the offshore, called Offshore Renewable Energy Platform. There are 18 of us working in different uh, activities for offshore renewables. Uh, we began with uh, wave and tidal energy. We then moved to float in offshore wind, and we also uh, have some activities in uh, bottom peaks. Uh, some figures about uh, our, our group. Uh, we've been working in offshore renewables since 2004. As mentioned before, first in, in wave energy, then we moved to floating wind. We, in these uh, 18 years, we had uh, some incomes, uh, 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 more than 40 million incomes in uh, research uh, activities. Uh, we developed four patents, transferred to industry in different uh, areas. Uh, we work with the main international uh, committees and associations. And uh, we also have been collaborating uh, very closely with the uh, uh, Basque uh, Energy Board in the development of the Basque Energy, uh, Basque Country uh, Strategy on Offshore Renewables, 
and also in setting up the BIMEP test site uh, of Soral Ninja. We also contribute to the main uh, associations and uh, R&D uh, institutions uh, in Europe. We have created two technology-based uh, companies, one of them called Oceantech for the development of a wave energy converter with the uh, oscillating water column uh, technology. It was uh, tested at sea for uh, almost uh, three years in the framework, framework of a European project called Opera. And uh, we transferred this uh, technology, this company, uh, to IDOM in 2018. IDOM is one of the reference engineering companies in the Basque Country. Uh, we followed more or less the same uh, process for the development of uh, the setting up of a, a Nautilus uh, company, which is a, a, a four column, Nautilus is a four column uh, floating uh, technology for uh, offshore wind. And uh, now the consortium is made up of uh, Subsea 7, who entered in the consortium in uh, last summer, Technalia and Vicinai, the uh, moving leader in uh, supplying moving. Uh, Marine lines, both for uh, oil and gas, and also the uh, floating wind sector. Well, we've been taking part in more than 20 European projects, leading five of them with more than 7 million uh, uh, funding in those projects. We mainly work in a couple, uh, a full couple uh, uh, analysis. Uh, we develop uh, multi-physical uh, numerical models uh, to uh, characterize the dynamics of the uh, whole floating wind turbine, including uh, the structure, the moorings, uh, dynamic uh, cables. We have experience in uh, modeling uh, and, uh, and testing in uh, reduced scale in hydrodynamic uh, wave tanks. We also work in physical and uh, virtual sensing uh, to acquire those in that uh, information coming from the uh, numerical models or the physical test and uh, to work with that uh, information to produce uh, uh, refined uh, numerical models, more uh, accurate uh, numerical models. We applied all uh, this knowledge to the generation and uh, evaluation of uh, different type of uh, concepts and devices. Uh, we work in the technology development, as mentioned before, on uh, the uh, foundation, mooring, uh, umbilicals uh, for the numerical modeling of those uh, uh, components. We also work in uh, the development of uh, digital twins for uh, different uh, subsystems, testing components, and uh, also uh, support to uh, promoters and engineering companies on early stage uh, project permitting, mainly uh, in the techno-economic feasibility studies for, for the uh, project's uh, presentation. Some examples of uh, our activity in, in terms of, uh, uh, of projects. Uh, this is an uh, uh, age 2020 European project uh, called LICE 50 Plus for the qualification of four different floating uh, technologies uh, designed for 10 megawatt uh, wind turbines. Uh, the technologies are uh, Nautilus, four column semi submersible in steel, uh, Ulaf Volsen, a Norwegian uh, three column uh, semi submersible uh, made in uh, concrete, Ideol, uh, the barge uh, concept in concrete, and also Ibertola's TLP still uh, design. We work in uh, numerical modeling, we develop tools for uh, the life cycle assessment and the evaluation. Uh, 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 techno economic evaluation of the four concepts. We also uh, contributed to the risk analysis of uh, all the concepts. Uh, Technalia coordinated the work package for the design of those uh, uh, four concepts. For 500 megawatt uh, reference uh, wind farms uh, located in three different areas with uh, three different uh, conditions. In uh, more locally, uh, we are also uh, working in vast government funded projects, uh, one of them called Sea uh, Power, again with uh, uh, these uh, in reference engineering companies in the Basque Country, IDOM. We are working with them in the development of a jacket foundation. And with Sener, we uh, are also working with them in a floating wind concept, which will be presented uh, in, in Bilbao Wind Europe exhibition. And with other companies in uh, some other uh, activities that you can uh, see uh, in, in this slide. 
the same uh, program, the ASITEC uh, program uh, of the Basque government also uh, funded the wind to grid uh, project. Uh, in this case, we are working with IDOM and Nautilus, some other uh, partners, but mainly uh, IDOM and Nautilus in the uh, design of a floating uh, substation. Uh, we define two reference wind farms, one in the west coast of the United States with uh, six to 700 uh, water depths, and another one in one of the uh, leasing areas in the, the Scott Wind project in 100 meters water depth. And uh, regarding the uh, working, uh, as mentioned before, we uh, collaborate with the main associations, uh, with the main uh, committees uh, like uh, Wind Europe, uh, Ocean Energy Europe, the International Energy Agency, the main, uh, yeah, uh, centers and uh, uh, technology research institutes in Europe uh, through the uh, European uh, Energy Research uh, Alliance, the IRA, and uh, yeah, some uh, Spanish uh, associations and clusters. And uh, that's all from my side. If you really need uh, more information, you can contact me, me an email or we can uh, organize a, a visit in a uh, Green Europe conference in Bilbao in a couple of weeks. Thank you for your attention. Thank you, Herman. Thank you very much for your interesting and clear presentation. We hope the we hope now the audience uh, know better uh, our capacities for development of short technologies a little bit and so please if you have some question or query introduce in, in, in the app introduce it in the app so um, now let's uh, turn your attention to the second speaker uh, the second speaker is Mariola Rodriguez she is an industrial engineering by the Navarre, Indust uh, Navarre University um, she works as um, a um, project manager uh, in the um, advanced manufacturing area of industrial and mobility unit of Technalia. And uh, she works, uh, she, she, has, she is an expert uh, in robotic systems. And today, Mariola is going to explain <clears throat> the technical characteristics of a particular particular cable robot system developed together um, at the Spanish re relevant um, company of cranes, HASO. Um, this, uh, as you can see soon, this technology is interesting not only because it can help us to move uh, uh, big components, but also because um, it, can help, uh, it can help us to reduce costs and increase products, increase productivity. So um, the title of uh, her uh, presentation is Transforming the Manufacturing Process in the Wind Energy Sector by the Use of Crane Bot System, a Flexible Robotic Crane. Mariola, the floor is yours. Thank okay. you. Okay, thank you, Icone, for your kind presentation. Uh, good morning to all of you and thank you for, for attending to this uh, webinar. Okay, so uh, CraneBot. Okay, CraneBot is a flexible robotic crane. Uh, sorry, let me one minute. Okay, so uh, CraneBot, it is a flexible robotic crane that consists of a system the rate of freedom large parallel robot uh, driven by eight cables that are integrated in a quantic crane and that work in synchronization with the main hoist of the crane. It, it is an innovative uh, machinery and its result from combining the cable suspended robot technology with the traditional quantic crane. Its purpose is to keep the same low capabilities as in traditional gantry cranes 
what enable the full six degrees of freedom control of the payload. That means that we are able to control the three rotations and the three translations of the part that, uh, that it's fixed uh, to the mobile platform of the, of the robot. So thanks to CraneBot, uh, we are transforming cranes into robotic system. And, uh, and okay, we, we provide a, a novel solution patented uh, that is uh, suitable for optimizing processes in large sp sp spaces and that sum the capability of the cranes and the, uh, and the parallel cable robots. Its main characteristics are uh, flexibility, uh, control, accuracy and safety. And here uh, you can see the, the components of this, uh, of this machine. So we will have the bridge crane with the secondary country and the main and, and with the main hoist. We have also eight uh, servo winches, and you can see they are integrated on the on the bridge, on the cornet of the, of the bridge in pairs. We also have uh, eight uh, set of routing elements that make possible the, the guiding of the cable for, uh, from the drum of the, of the winches uh, to the mobile platform. And the electrical cabinet, as you can see here, is embarked on the on the bridge crane. Uh, the, the mobile platform of the of, of the robots, uh, well, in the mobile platform of the robots, uh, we can't uh, we can fix or attach any kind of, of gripper uh, that we need in order to make any manipulation. Uh, we can uh, we can fix any any mechanical gripper, hydraulic gripper, uh, vacuum type uh, gripper. Uh, in order to okay to handle uh, parts and to uh, and to make assembly of parts uh, with accurate and uh, don't forget that we are controlling the six degrees of freedom so we are controlling the three rotations and the three translation translations so no oscillations are um, are possible uh, during this handling. Uh, also uh, we can also integrate in this uh, mobile platform any head in case that uh, we want to automate any operation performed in that part. And this is, for instance, very interesting for uh, the, the wind and the towers of the, of, the, of the wind turbines because of the large, uh, large dimension. The design of the mobile platform is adapted uh, for each uh, operation. And, uh, okay, and, and the two main uh, applications that uh, can be performed by, by this uh, CreamBot system are the following. So first, uh, we are able uh, to, to make a control and precise handling and assembly of parts. And we are also able to automate operations that are performed in large parts. And we, uh, we can automate a sanding process, for instance, painting, inspection, 3D printing, welding, drilling, uh, sealant, uh, applying, repairing, um, and other kind of, of maintenance operations. The main advantages of the Kerenbot system is that uh, we provide a fully controlled in position and orientation of the load while it is being manipulated. Uh, we also provide a precise load handling and movement without oscillations. This is a, a really important point in any direction and in any orientation. And we are able to automate operations throughout the whole production plant. Uh, the, the hoist capacity is not okay, it's, it's provided by, by the hoist of the crane, so there is not limit. As in the market, you can find crane of uh, several tons of, of, of lift capacity. Uh, thanks to the use of CraneBot, we are able to increase the productivity of your processes in your plant. Uh, okay, the, 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 we enhance plant safety. Um, in, the, in the pulleys of the, of the cable robot, uh, there are uh, four sensors uh, mounted. So we are all the time monitoring the, the cable tension uh, of, of the robot. And if the tension are out of the limit, uh, uh, the, the, the machine stops. And this solution is, uh, is flexible, it's versatile, so it's suitable for performing many tasks in, in multiple sectors. Uh, the, the cable robot technology, um, okay, the cable robot technology um, is able to uh, control uh, the position uh, and the orientation of, of the mobile platform and, of course, of the components attached to it just by controlling in a synchronously way 
the, the length of the cables. So this is what we are doing all the time. We are controlling uh, how much cable is rolled or un un unrolled in order to control the length and in order to locate the platform uh, wherever we want. And Yes, I want to show you a video of the of the Creambot uh, system that we have uh, installed at the facility of, of Hasso. As Igone has mentioned before, okay, Hasso is the is the partner that, that has acquired the, the license of the technology. So, if you are interested in acquiring uh, one uh, one unit of this uh, of this uh, system, Hasso uh, is the is the company is the industrial company that we will provide it to you. So here you, you can see the, the, the Creambot system that we have. The payload capability is 2.5 uh, tons. Here you can see the, how the movement and the rotations are controlled thanks to uh, controlling the length of the, of, the, of the cables. Here you can see how cables are attached to the mobile platform. And you, you can see also the, the different components that I have mentioned before, the, the winches, and the drums, uh, the pulleys, the, the mobile platform. Okay, this is just one design of mobile platform that we have, but uh, uh, please uh, remember that uh, we will uh, design a specific platform for the operation that you uh, uh, is interested in. Uh, regarding the control, we are using an industrial controller. Uh, it is via uh, automation, but uh, we could do also uh, work with uh, Beko. Uh, both are PLC, but uh, we uh, have integrated and CNC modules uh, for, uh, for path uh, programming. As it is a robot, we can control the whole system uh, manually with the radio controller. So from the, from the same uh, radio controller, we are able to control all the movement of the crane and also of the cable robot. And uh, we have also developed a human uh, machine interface in order to pre-program trajectory and be able to uh, run the, the trajectories uh, automatically in afterwards. And okay, here you can see the, that uh, sanding head has been integrated in this uh, mobile platform, and you can see that the, the robot is is uh, following the the shape, the complex shape of the of the, of the wind and we are uh, autom uh, automating the, the sanding process. Okay, so sanding, uh, so the automation of sanding is one of the applications that uh, could be performed with a crane bot. Uh, you know that sanding nowadays is performed manually. It is a very time consuming task. It is unhealthy for the operators because of the glass fiber dust. The, the quality, or so the surface quality, depends on the operator who is performing the, the sanding. So, thanks to the use of, uh, of framebot, uh, we will be able to increase the productivity of the of the process. Uh, we will prevent the operators for, for uh, performing uh, tasks that are not ergonomic and and harmful uh, due to the dust generated, and uh, we we will ensure the sanding uniformity and be independent. Of the operator who executes it, because it is going to be the, the, the robot, the crane robot system, who will uh, perform the, the, the sanding. Another example of, of applications that could be performed with uh, with crane bot is the accurate assembly of the main shaft with the gearbox of, of the wind turbines. Uh, the, the process uh, has very high accuracy requirements. Uh, there are very heavy parts involved. Nowadays, uh, cranes, conventional cranes are using the, the cranes uh, handle the, the gearbox, as you can see, and you can see in this image, and there are benches for fixing the main shaft. This operation is very time consuming and is highly dependable on the operator's expertise. And it is high risky operation in the sense that it has a very high cost impact if bad assembly is detected once the going to bind is assembled at part site. 
Okay, so the, 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 the objective or, or what we wanted to do get using Cranebot is first to assure the good assembly of all the operations and to avoid any, any error in order to avoid uh, spending uh, a lot of uh, euros uh, to solve that, that problem. And also, thanks to Cranebot, uh, these operations will be independent uh, of the operator's expertise. Now we are we are working in uh, in defining the, the strategy in order to make this assembly. We are doing that uh, with the Cranebot that we have at Hasso uh, using a mockup uh, because uh, because uh, the, the, the payload capability of our system is just 2.5 tons. Okay, so we are uh, doing okay. We are uh, developing the strategy and testing the, the strategy and see and. Um, and here you can see photos of those uh, of the tests that we are performing right now. Then uh, another operation uh, that could be done with the Cranebot system is the automated inside and outside uh, blasting and painting of the wind towers. Uh, most of the time, this solution or this operation, sorry, is, is made manually. It's also time-consuming and unhealthy for the for the operator. Uh, they are on the market commercial solution. For, for the outside uh, of, of the tower, uh, but uh, they are too expensive and most of the wind towers manufacturers uh, don't integrate it. Um, okay, if, uh, if a tower manufacturer wants uh, to automate both the uh, inside and outside painting, nowadays they need uh, to buy and, and, and install two different equipment, one for the outside and another one for the inside. And that means a high investment. Uh, thanks to, to Craybot, uh, we can provide just one equipment, reconfigurable, suitable for the inside and outside blasting and painting of the wind towers. And that means to reduce the investment requirements, and that means to provide a cost effective solutions for the wind towers manufacturers. In this slide, you can see the conceptual design of this of this equipment, as I have said, is just what one equipment is reconfigurable for the inside and outside blasting or painting of the, of the wind tower. Uh, okay, we need an, an extractor uh, that will be outside uh, the painting cabinet. In this extractor, we are going to fix the, the winches and the pulleys. And it is important to have the winches uh, outside the, the cabinet um, in order to reduce the in order to, the, to reduce the cost of the installation, and so inside the, the cabinet we will have the mobile platform with the cables, of course, and the painting gun installed in the in the mobile platform. So, okay, so this will be the, the solution for painting the the outside and for painting the inside. What we have to do is to change the mobile platform and substitute this mobile platform by this one. And in order to do that, we have to uh, detach the cables from the mobile, from one mobile platform and to attach the cables again to the second mobile platform. And in order to do that, okay, we will need uh, a special extractor in order to reroute uh, the cables. So, okay, these are the these are the, the, the operations. Well, these are uh, yes, the, the, the operations that could be uh, performed with the with the Cranebot uh, system. But these are just examples. Okay, we we are open. Okay, to to know uh, another applications that that uh, you could be interested in, and uh, we will thank you for for your attention. And we would like to invite you to meet at at the Wind Europe Fair uh, in Bilbao in, in two weeks. And also you are invited to visit the, the installation of HASO and to visit the, the Cranebot system that uh, we, we have there. So thank you very much. Thank you. <clears throat> thank you, Mariola. <clears throat> thank you very much for your visual and didactic presentation. And um, please don't forget uh, to introduce your questions in the app. Um, now let's move on uh, the third uh, on the third presentation. Uh, 
The speaker is uh, Diego Galar. Hello, Diego. Uh, Diego Galar is degree in electrical engineering by the Zaragoza University. And um, in this case, he has a uh, relevant international and academic background in the ma matter of mines and reliability. And he works, uh, he also works for the area of smart system at the industry and mobility unit in Tecnalia. And well, um, he is an expert um, on the definition of digital maintenance strategies and tools for both uh, industrial systems and energy systems. Um, the title of um, his presentation is Digital Wind Farms and Industrial uh, Artificial Intelligence Approach. And uh, Diego, the floor is yours. Thank you very much, Igone, for your kind introduction. I guess that you, you can see my screen. Diego, perfectly, no problem. Okay, you can see my screen, right? Perfect. Okay, thank you. Yes, sir. Okay, good morning, everyone. Yes, sir. It's for me a pleasure to, to be here with you. Yes, sir, sharing the uh, advance that in Tecnalia we are doing in terms of analytics and uh, digital twins uh, for, uh, for wind farms. Basically, what I'm going to expose here is the different approaches that we have in Tecnalia for the artificial intelligence in terms of industrial AI. We have to be aware that industrial AI is the domain specifically uh, tailor-made for the Industry 4.0 approach with a special relevance in the wind uh, sector. It's, uh, in wind sector, we move all the way up from descriptive analytics to cognitive analytics. And the different uh, analytics that we are working in, uh, in wind is something that uh, is, goes from descriptive, that is just the detection of the failure, that is or detection of some anomaly in the system, that is maybe the basic, the more basic stuff, the most basic stuff that we can perform in terms of, of AI, but we can move up to the diagnostic analytic where we can not only detect something wrong, but also the, uh, the identification of such failure, that is the concept of diagnosis, but we can move um, uh, more uh, advanced analytics to go for predictive analytics where we predict when the failure is going to happen, the concept of remaining useful life, and in case we have different scenarios, like in the wind farms uh, operation planning, we can move to prescriptive analytics. That is prescriptive analytics where we can design the different operational profiles of our uh, windmills. Of course, cognitive analytics would be the last, uh, the last part of the uh, analytics concept in terms of automation of these tasks without the humans uh, in the loop. The concept of uh, uh, from descriptive to uh, prescriptive analytics is something that definitely we have to perform in some platform. And here is where the digital twin comes into the picture. Actually, the digital twin for us in the in wind farms is a really good engineering tool to twin the assets and be able to perform the analytics and provide the services based on these assets. Basically, the twin is, a, is, a, is one engine where we have the data, we have the analytics, and we deliver services for the customers. Of course, the structure that in Tecnalia we are approaching for digital twins in, in the analytics that is performed there is we need one smart connected product, we need the sensors and all the options that the sensors have, we need the digital twin platform, and we need the services that are delivered by such platform. This is the basic digital twin um, uh, structure architecture that we might have. In wind farms, we are working in two different types of digital twins from population uh, point of view. We have the stochastic digital twin, is where you have one digital entity and you project all the uh, all the physical entities on one entity. We, this is a stochastic approach, probabilistic approach, very linked to the RAMS approach, and this, this is what we call the stochastic digital twin. And we have the real-time digital twin where every uh, physical instance has a replica in the digital world. It's one-to-one -one connection, one physical entity, one digital entity. But if we come to the complexity of the analytics, the digital twins, I'm going to uh, give in four minutes the different categories of digital twins that we work in Technalia for wind farms. 
The basic digital twin is the digital twin 1.0. That is the digital twin that you, you may see in most of the wind farms. What is digital twin 1.0? It's a digital twin where we take the operational technology data, basically the SCADA data that comes every 10 minutes uh, from the wind farm, and we perform, we perform analytics in terms of deviation from normality. Is the concept, the concept of normality models as uh, the, the AI says, and of course, if any deviation from normality happens, then we have some warning. Doesn't mean that it's a failure. It's something different from reality, uh, from normality. And this digital twin 1.0 actually is quite popular in, uh, in, in windmills because we are having a lot of information uh, from the SCADA data that is coming every 10 minutes. That's why due to the simplicity and due to the low complexity of these models, the digital wind 0.0 based on operational technologies is quite popular. But if you want to go one step forward and you want to have the different breakdown, the taxonomy of the, of the uh, windmill, and also you want to link uh, the different events, the concept of semantic ontology to define what is the reality of the uh, of the windmill. Basically, if you have some abnormal reading, this uh, shut down the windmill, and this shut down the windmill, maybe is, uh, you launch a maintenance or corrective action, etc. The link of these events is what we call uh, semantic ontologies, and this is when we perform the convergence between operational technologies, ESCADA, etc., with the information technology, CMMS, etc. And this IT and OT convergence produce the digital twin 2.0. It's not only based on operational technology data, but also data that is coming from the CMMS, ERP, etc. This data is much richer in information because merging the operational technology data together with the IT data, we are creating some metadata, and this metadata is much richer in terms of information. Therefore, the diagnosis is possible, and also we can do some kind of prognosis. That's why the digital twin 2.0 is quite powerful, and we are working on that in several points. But if you look at the prediction side, and in wind farms, we are talking about life extension very often, we cannot predict the future based on the past. The, the, the damage and the degradation mechanism that will work in the future, we cannot assume that are the same mechanisms that are working in the past. And that's why the data-driven uh, solutions has to be, have to be combined with operational maintenance solutions. Basically, we have to bring the expert knowledge in the system. And that's why the concept of hybrid models where data-driven combines with physics of the failure is coming much stronger more and more in our uh, wind farms and in our uh, wind energy domain. Indeed, the digital twin 3.0 is not only the convergence of OT uh, and IT, but also ET the engineering technologies, the physics of the failure, in such, in such a way that when we have our data, basically what we do based on the RAS analysis is to see, okay, in my data, I have some information about X number of failure modes, but maybe I don't have all the data of the failure modes. If I don't have data of some failure modes that eventually might happen, definitely I need, I need physics of the failure to complete these data sets with synthetic data or whatever in order to be able to predict events that they have not happened yet. And this is very relevant because our data sets are very rich in data, but very poor in terms of information. That's why we need the, the, the data twin 3.0 if we want to do certain things like life extension or prediction of degradation scenarios uh, where we don't have the all the failure modes in our data sets. But we have also some failures that might happen and we are not able to identify those failures because they are not in our records of data and they are not in our uh, FMECA or RAMS analysis. This is what we call this kind of invisible failures and these invisible failures, when they pop up, they can create what we call the black swan losses. Something that I didn't know that eventually could happen but happen and the uh, catastrophic consequences are terrible. When I'm able to introduce and identify this stuff is what we call the digital twin 4.0. Basically, the digital twin 4.0 is the attempt to turn the black swans into white, and then I'm able to identify these events. And then when this contextual, contextual situation is going to happen again, 
I might identify that this black swan may pop up and then I'm able to recognize such situation. Of course, this kind of uh, extreme data is very popular now because uh, we can uh, we can skip many catastrophic consequences and the concept of digital twin 4.0, including this information, is extremely relevant. Indeed, the digital twin 4.0 is uh, actually compressing different data, not only the data from the SCADA system, that is the most popular data, but also the data from the context, everything surrounding the contextual approach of the wind farm, the data of the physics of the failure, those data that are completing the incomplete data sets that we have, and also the surprises, unfortunate events that might happen and can create catastrophic consequences. Uh, in summary, let me say that uh, in Technalia, we are trying to provide different digital twins for different approaches in function of the customer needs. Uh, definitely, uh, we have to be aware that most of the people that are dealing with analytics for wind farms, they have tons of data, but very tiny amount of information. That's why we have to be aware that hybrid models are needed. But especially nowadays uh, that we are facing the life extension of our assets, we have to be aware that hybrid models are really needed because we cannot extend the life of our assets based on data-driven approach that don't contain the failure mechanism of this, uh, uh, of, of these assets in degradation stages that I have not ever seen. And definitely, the maintenance, uh, the digital twin 5.0 will move uh, when these physical models, uh, they can also evolve and this kind, the concept of evolution and physical models are model driven to make also the physics of the failure evolving together with our data. But definitely, we are uh, we are there, and uh, if you are interested in any of the of the models that I commented from Technalia side, that uh, none of them is bad, but they uh, they are serving different uh, purpose in the concept of maintenance as a service for the digital twins. Please let us know, and we will be very happy providing some additional information. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Diego, for this uh, exciting and topical presentation. And please, <clears throat> please invite you <clears throat> to make questions. And now um, let's finish with the last speaker. Uh, our last speaker is Pablo Benguria. Um, he's um, in degree in biology, biology and environmental sciences by the Basque Country University. Um, Pablo, <clears throat> since 2016, is project manager in the materials uh, for a stream conditions group of the uh, energy, climate and urban uh, unit of Technalia. And uh, it's important uh, to remark his work in the design, construction, installation and exploitation of the house lab infrastructure. And as uh, you can see now, the house lab is the unique uh, singular floating lab in Europe but to the same uh, material and components in real condition, in offshore real conditions. Uh, he's going to speak about now has lab a floating laboratory for pre-market pre research of solutions for offshore. Uh, it's your turn. Thank you, Pablo. Okay, thank you, Ivone. Uh, thanks for the nice presentation. Um, well, as you said, uh, I'm presenting the, the has lab. Has lab. I would say it's uh, at the, at the beginning, it was a material, uh, a laboratory for materials, but now uh, it's not that anymore, only that uh, we, we can consider that uh, HasLab is a, is a laboratory, not only for materials, but also for other kind of solutions for offshore industry, which I guess is quite interesting for the audience today, uh, as, uh, as Herman explained uh, before. Uh, most or uh, many of the future developments in the in the wind industry is going are going offshore. So, uh, Haslab is the the, the first uh, offshore floating laboratory. Uh, it was installed for the first time in September 2018. But uh, but in, in September last last year we we uh, towed it uh, to to the port in order to install a new version uh, during the next uh, weeks. I said. 
Uh, okay, this is uh, the, the we we design a two stages uh, strategy as you can see here. This is the first one. It's a small uh, boy about five meters uh, diameter, where we could test uh, small components and props in three uh, atmospheric in three exposition uh, zones, immersion, splash, atmospheric. It was quite simple. No no electric supply, no uh, decks, uh, no whatever. But now we are going into this uh, bigger, more complex. Uh, um, laboratory uh, where we could add uh, a couple of exposition zones uh, more and we will be connected uh, to, to the map uh, grid uh, both uh, in, in electrical power and in, in data. So this is a peak of the of the new Hush lab waiting to be installed uh, in the map. Uh, here is in, in this picture is in the in the port of Bilbao where it's right now. Uh, it's about uh, 8.5 meters diameter, say, uh, 7 meters high, and about 20, uh, 120 tons. So it's a pretty big uh, uh, laboratory. We will be able to, have, to hold up to uh, 2,000 samples, but not only samples, as I said, as we are equipped with a, with a crane, uh, a crane, a David, and, and so on. And most importantly, we will be uh, grid connected, so you can test here uh, everything or uh, a device that uh, needs to be uh, fed by, by electricity. Uh, we have a, a website which is not yet uh, updated with the, with the new HasLab. We will do it as soon as we uh, bring it to, to, to BMEP area. Okay, this is BMEP area, in case you, you, you don't know it, it's an experimental uh, uh, infrastructure for testing and demonstrating prototype devices for harnessing ocean energy. We are not uh, strictly a, a, a device for harnessing energy, but the uh, structure is quite uh, useful for us as, as is uh, located in the, in the Gulf of Biscay, uh, 1.6 nautical miles away from the coast, which is quite close to, to, to visit it regularly and uh, far enough to, to, to represent the real offshore conditions as is it open to the to most of the uh, more uh, powerful as well from the uh, northwest. Uh, it's about five kilometers square kilometers in, in total area and I said is as I said is uh, equipped with a subsea infrastructure which is quite useful for us as well to, to connect to the grid and to the power. And it's uh, very important as well is uh, uh, 25 hours, seven days a day, seven days a week uh, surveillance. So this is uh, the the has lab, the new has lab uh, when it was uh, put in the water in the port of Ilbao in back in November. Uh, we have the, the atmospheric zone, the splash zone, and the immersion zone. Those peaks are from the first version of the has lab, but it will be uh, pretty much the same. So we are, as I said, we have uh, uh, up to. 2,000 samples that can be tested at the same time. Uh, uh, this is a scheme where we can see the three uh, already mentioned uh, exposition zones. Uh, we can test also moving companies, uh, moving components, sorry, uh, which we will be can be useful for for floating uh, offshore industry. Uh, the testing of umbilicals, collectors, and rises as well as is, these are one of the components that uh, suffers from more. Uh, uh, failures in the in the real life operations, uh, we will be able as well to test in, in seabed at 65 uh, meter depth, and we have a little rough for for uh, submarine operations as well. So uh, none of this testing will be useful if we cannot monitor the the metoceanic conditions of the of the of the hash lab. So we can uh, we know that the oceanogra oceanographic uh, uh, data by means of a couple of oceanographic boys. One of them is, is stored in, in, in the pet area, uh, quite close to the house lab, and the other one is in front of the San Sebastian coast. Uh, we have also a coast, uh, a coastal meteorological station quite close in Machichaco Cape. Uh, it's about uh, 10 kilometers away from the house lab, so it's quite representative. And now we will have uh, our own uh, onboard meteorological station in the house lab, which is quite what is the best solution, of course. Of course, we have uh, measured all the meteorological and oceanographic, uh, oceanographic data uh, in the past, the means, the, the maximums and the minimums. Uh, we uh, have also identified the main uh, biofouling species that occurs in the in the in the map area. 
And uh, while well, the testing at, at HashLab, of course, we can perform our corrosion testing. This is our main uh, future, or one of the main features. We have already characterized the, 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 the corrosivity of uh, each exposition zone in the, in the HashLab. Uh, we can test, of course, uh, anti fouling solutions, which is uh, even more important than, than the corrosion testing, because corrosion you can test, uh, acceler you can perform accelerated testing in, in the lab. But you cannot perform anti-fouling uh, testing in any any other way, any other uh, any other way than than in than in real life. Uh, aging testing, of course, uh, sometimes is not only about corrosion or uh, anti-fouling. It's it's also about aesthetic or or maybe mechanical properties that are affected, or how the uh, sensor will survive to the offshore environment. Uh, the validation of risers, connectors, and umbilicals, of course. Uh, as I said before, it's a quite relevant uh, uh, problem to the offshore industry. Um, testing of offshore communication systems, uh, um, we are currently testing a couple of them on board, uh, well, GPH days, uh, services, and so on, and uh, testing equipment in service. Uh, this is a picture of the uh, indoor deck that we have, at, uh, the, the lower deck in, in the HAS lab is pretty big. So here we can test anything that can be uh, connected to the grid. So as I said, it's not we are not limited to, to testing probes as we were in the in the first version. Uh, this is some examples of uh, devices that we have tested or we are testing uh, right now. Uh, a tracker system for for navigation and monitoring floating structures, which is quite useful for us to monitor the position of the HasLab. Uh, as you will imagine, a, a, a laboratory in, in the middle of the sea is quite difficult to, to, to monitor the position. So we have to have a, a very good uh, monitoring uh, because it's the only way that we have to uh, control the, the integrity of the mooring lines, for example. If one of the mooring lines is, break, is broken, uh, then we detect a movement in the, in the lab. Uh, we, have tested as well uh, identification and communication systems uh, under the water, uh, novel sensor for offshore applications, uh, new methodologies for mooring offshore structures. Uh, we are currently using one. Uh, summary handling uh, systems, uh, optional fish brothers, and uh, whatever you can imagine. So uh, we are open to test uh, any kind of uh, device that uh, is uh, feasible uh, to test in, in, the, in the lab. Okay, we are open, as I said, to, to any uh, company or research organization interested in performing uh, testing offshore, uh, both in, in the framework or, or uh, public funded projects or by means of uh, private projects. This is some of the companies that have already tested in the, in the lab. Uh, we also test, of course, our own developments here. Some of our colleagues, some of my colleagues are working on anti fouling solutions, anti corrosion solutions, and they, in fact, develop a couple of patents uh, on new coatings that have been tested there as well. Uh, these are, this is the, the, the first project that, that uh, uh, was in which the, the HAS lab was, was designed. This is the HAS project funded by the, by the Basque country. Uh, MarineNet2 is a European project where the HAS lab was included as a single infrastructure for, for offshore testing. Uh, Nemo is a project about uh, improving the performance of tidal blades uh, and tidal devices. A new skin is a project which is quite cross cutting uh, about uh, improving uh, as well the, the advanced surfaces for anti corrosion and anti fouling uh, properties, which are funded by these uh, uh, organisms that you might already know. Okay, we have a couple of sites uh, apart from the Hash Lab where we can contrast the results that we have here. Uh, this is the, in the port of Pasaya, it's quite close to San Sebastian, also in the Basque Country. Uh, we also only have immersion zone in a floating jetty, so we don't have a uh, tidal zone. Uh, the, uh, the, the advantage of this uh, place is that we have a quite easy access and, and monitoring of environmental uh, parameters, is uh, just in the port. So we have monitored the environmental conditions as well. Uh, we have here a very, very uh, high growth of biofolio, which is our first uh, test that we performed before going to the HAS lab. And this is the, the, another infrastructure that is placed in, in, in the Canary Island in the port of Tariarte. 
So here we had them to, to, to design and construct these this, uh, 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 racks where they can uh, test uh, samples in splash tidal inversion zones. Uh, they also have an oceanographic station nearby, so we can send them samples that maybe we want to test both in a um, climate as, uh, as, as in the Gulf of Biscay, and then uh, again uh, in the, in the uh, South Atlantic or uh, subtropical climate in, in Canary Islands. Okay, and of course uh, we can we have a, a fully equipped uh, laboratory in the in the, in our facilities in in in, in Technalia, uh, with uh, plenty of uh, uh, cameras uh, chambers for for accelerating testing, uh, general corrosion facilities as well, and uh, coating laboratory testing. Of course, we can uh, also uh, uh, evaluate the results of antifouling corrosion by means of a couple of antifouling uh, standards, uh, which are quite useful for us to, to, to evaluate the results of antifouling uh, solutions. So that's all, I guess I'm on time. Uh, there you have my uh, email and my phone number. If you have any, any doubt or any question, or you might now uh, want to know uh, how to access to the, to the HasLab. As I said, it's open to, to anybody who, who can uh, test here. So thank you, that's all. <clears throat> thank you, Pablo. <clears throat> thank you. I'm sorry because uh, we don't have time to ask questions now, <clears throat> but please uh, we encourage to make questions to our speakers by email or visit us at the 1D022 stand in the Wind Europe uh, Fair in a couple of weeks. And uh, thank you, thank you again for your inter interest and attention. And we hope to meet you again soon. And please uh, fill in the, the questionnaire that we are going to launch now. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye.